A copyright lawyer or? Left wing activist lawyer, yeah. <laughs> uh, who, who kind of came into copyright um, issues as part of his his uh, other activism, uh, and he's going to talk with us about uh, fair use and uh, battle tactics for copyright. Thank you. What I want to convince you of is that the First Amendment and its little sister, fair use doctrine, are not weapons. The First Amendment and Fair Use Doctrine are the peace treaties that you may be offered after you have fucked up the intellectual copyright establishment in any copyright fight. But if all you have to do in that fight is engage in this kind of high-minded liberal whining about how there ought to be freedom of thought, and we ought to be let alone, and the claims of the people who say they've got property in ideas and words and, and so forth, that they should be, that ought to be disregarded, you're not going to find that courts do anything for you under the First Amendment because they're, they're always going to flinch against the more, more powerful demands of capital. Now, the copyright statute on fair use, this is what, this is what it says. It is deliberately vague. It doesn't set out any clear categories where you know that you are protected. It does say that use for purposes such as criticism, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, research may not be an infringement of copyright. But in any particular case, courts get to look at these four factors like a Rorschach blot. And they project their fantasies about how the dominant social order should prevail into all these things. And you have court decisions that say, well, this may be a non-commercial use, but that's only one of the four factors. And because we find that what the defendant has been doing in this case actually hurts the market for the use, uh, we're going to find that the mere fact that it's non-commercial doesn't get you off the hook. Nature of the copyrighted work, what does that mean? If the nature of the copyrighted work is such that the person who claims to own it wants to invest money in lawyers to come after you to stop using it, then the court is going to find that the nature of the copyrighted work is such that it deserves protection. Amount and substantiality of work. Again, this is something that, that right-wing courts will always dance around. Even if you say, Your Honor, I've only used a hundred words of the, of the text. I've only used part of the film. I've only used it a cropped and edited part of the picture. They're always going to be left to say, yeah, but you used enough that it made the owner of the copyrighted work, whose nature we've already determined is something that deserves to be protected, uh, you know, that, that you've already used enough. And they always come back to this, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. And the copyright owner is always going to say, because I am sufficiently offended by the alleged infringement that I think that this hurts the market for my work, that in itself should demonstrate that this is not a fair use. It's not that every judge will fall for these kinds of arguments. It's that in the current judicial system, you can't be sure that you will win the game of Russian roulette in, this, in, in finding out exactly where your particular judge is coming from, unless you have already beaten uh, but, you know, unless you've already beaten the, uh, the copyright owner in extrajudicial ways. Is there precedent on, uh, I forgot, was it 26 or 14 words that is more or less okay to quote without infringement copyright? Uh, there's a rule of thumb that came from the Nation magazine litigation over the Gerald Ford memoirs that says 100 words 100 is words. presumptively okay. But how you apply that when you're talking about nonverbal media, you know, Digital bytes. Yeah, but even if you, you stay with the like say articles and whatever, I mean, is that enough of a defense if you get sued for something? You say no. Usually, oh. but usually, but, okay. usually, but here's the here's the problem: is that in the I mean, in the real world, world calculus, uh, a small person who is not a for-profit, you know, a, you know, behemoth ready to go to war against these guys. Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself whether you feel lucky, punk. You know, when you get the threat letter, the question is fight or flight. You know, and 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 because 
the consequences of losing litigation are so much more dire for you than for Turner Broadcasting or whoever's coming after you. They will always be able to use the cease and desist letter, you know, the, the, the threat, as, as leverage to push you out. Unless, unless you follow the following countermeasures. One thing that's lovely about intellectual property ideology is that it's just the same as the ideology of like 16th century English property law. That you know, the idea is that the, the, the right descends from the crown. <clears throat> And you own title in the work because the sovereign has said that you own it. And what ended up happening, what destroyed English property law, is that over the course of centuries, there was so much theft and fraud and, uh, you know, that, that in, in the transmission of land title that by the time you hit the, the 19th and 20th centuries, it became increasingly impossible for property owners to claim clear title before they went around threatening people off their land. And this is a game that the likes of us, the, you know, the, the anarchist libertarians who are resisting the claims of capital, ought to be able to use more. It's not that we accept the idea of bourgeois property rights. We're just pointing out that in a surprisingly large number of cases, the corporation threatening you does not actually have clear title to the thought that it claims to own. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Michael? Yes. If I can just uh, state one thing going back before you go any further regarding um, the cease and desist letter. Yeah. I volunteer for an organization, um, not profit organization, and they created videos of rallies and demonstrations and stuff. And um, in one of the videos, one of the, one of the problems is I'm in independent video production. One of the problems is they didn't, number one, properly credit anybody in the video, uh -huh. which, was, which is distributed on YouTube, which they have on YouTube. And secondly, in this one particular video, they used a song by, by a well-known reggae artist. Yeah. And I said, do you guys have permission to use the song? And the person who showed me the video said, no, we don't. And I yeah. said, well, you need to pull it, because if the publishing company or that artist is fishing the web, they're going to send you a cease and desist letter. Uh -huh. He said, we received a cease and desist letter already. I said, was it for this video? He said, no, it was for another video. And this organization has now two attorneys on staff. So they didn't even clear their video through their attorney. And this is a real problem with YouTube because people are violating whether you, you know, believe in the copyright laws or want to, you know, uh, you know, improve it or remove a lot of the restrictions, there are millions of people out there who don't know anything about the copyright laws that are violating them. So, you know, what, what do we do about that? Well, I'm actually glad about that aspect of YouTube because at least it, over the long term it creates a social culture that regards that kind of low-level use of other people's songs as something that's permissible, that regards it as actually unbelievably fascist when, when you know, Universal comes after Google and threatens to attack them for every single YouTube video that somebody posts that you know, uses a copyrighted song. But that, that doesn't solve your problem if you are the person who's being threatened, or you're advising them, and you can't explain how you uh, how you back you know how you would answer that threat. Let, let, yeah. me, let, let, okay. let, let me let me get to the period. Okay, sure. The problem that they don't own it in the first place is so sweet because it doesn't <laughs> it, it doesn't commit you to whether the judge is ultimately a partisan for the First Amendment. It means that you've got a defense even if you have some. Bush appointed, you know, Bush appointed federal judge who believes in nothing but property rights. Now, what I'm about to describe for you is is a a stunt that I have not yet pulled that I would like to pull. And if you are interested in working with me to pull it, let's talk about this afterwards. Okay. I believe that one of the things that the pirate party should be doing is setting booby traps. We should not sit around and talk about how we will defend ourselves when the thought police come after us. 
We should be aware that intellectual property law is incoherent. <laughs> it's contradictory. It's completely full of holes. And you know, it, you know, and seriously, it, 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 it hamstrings the, the capitalists who try to use it against us if we know how to pull the conflicting strings in the right way. And it's just the way that Earth First managed to shut down a great deal of logging by booby-trapping redwood trees with devices that would make anybody who took a chainsaw to it, you know, like, you know, ha have some sort of explosion, you know. And they only had to do that to one out of a thousand trees in the forest in order to protect the entire forest from being attacked. And what I really want is for the pirate party to start setting up people that we know do not own the property right in the thought or the concept that they try to enforce and then burn them on, on public declaratory judgment actions in court so often that in the future the copyright establishment won't know whether the party that they're threatening is actually a pirate party plant, is, you know, is, is, actually, is actually some way to blow up on them, like, bingo, Guy Fox jumps up, right? And, and they're not gonna threaten anybody for fear that there's gonna be some, some sort of blow up coming back, and let, let me explain the thought. I, I represent a lot of, uh, I represent labor unions, and we're always looking for devices to create shocking visuals in front of businesses that were boycotting, okay? And one thought I had would be that, you know, the next time we're on strike, we get out there and we unfurl an enormous banner of Guernica, which is something that will definitely grab attention and definitely turn people away from the business as they're walking in. But then the union folks get anxious and say, oh, this is terrible, we don't want to get sued, it's, 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 it's still within the copyright period. And it's true that you know, one of the saddest things to me about intellectual property, uh, you know, the, the culture, is that even the greatest freedom fighters out there, like Pablo Picasso or Martin Luther King, they die and they leave a bunch of children who are money-grubbing thugs who don't believe in any of the good things that their father stood for, and all they want to do is extort as much money as they can. I mean, the, the Martin Luther King estate shuts down things like the, uh, the Eyes on the Prize documentary because they said, oh, you didn't pay us for that clip of Martin Luther King speaking at the March on Washington. That the that there was a huge that the Martin Luther King stat of memorial in D.C. was delayed for like five years because the Martin Luther King children didn't think that they were being paid enough for the image of their father, which is something that their father would have just would have would have screamed at. The civil rights movement was about freedom of thought, was about fighting off defamation and copyright and trademark law in order to create a space for free speech. Well, it's true also with Picasso uh, estate. After Pablo dies in 1975, it's 1973, his children, who are just a bunch of greedy Euro trash, like Paloma Picasso, end up hiring the most fascist copyright lawyers to shut down any unauthorized use of, of, of the master's work. And they're notorious throughout Europe for being the absolute worst. Like the Renault car company did a commercial where they didn't even use a Picasso image. They just made up one that looked a little bit like it, you know, with the eyes out of place. And it was part of a funny, you know, animated ad for Renault cars. And the Picasso estate went after them in French court and shut them down. It is illegal in France even to imitate Picasso's style without paying Paloma Picasso a lot of money. Okay, so I'm thinking of, yes? Um, just going back real quick to what you said about Martin Luther King, exactly what you stated is why there's never been any Hollywood feature like film about Martin Luther King or any even independent feature like film is because of infighting on the family. And of course you point out that what yeah. that means yeah. is that it suppresses the dissemination of what he stood for. Yeah. Because his children just want to be paid for it, right? Okay. Here's what I love, 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 and I really, really want to do this soon, okay? <laughs> Guernica is different. Guernica is one of the only works of art that Picasso did on commission. <clears throat> Most of the stuff he just did in his garage or his attic and he owns it and therefore it's owned and the intellectual property descends to Paloma Picasso. 
Guernica was commissioned by the Spanish Republic for 150,000 francs in 1936 to be displayed on behalf of the Spanish Republic at the International Exposition in, in Paris. And Picasso made a big point out of getting a receipt to show he had been paid for it because he wanted it to be clear that the painting belonged not to him, but to the Spanish Republic. And three years later, after Franco overthrows the Spanish Republic, Picasso was left with this painting, which was still in Paris, and he displayed it in Paris sort of as the custodian, and he, you know, after, after France fell to the Nazis, he took it to London, and then he took it off to New York, where he put it in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And Pablo Picasso always insisted that he was only the guardian of the painting for the Spanish Republic. And what makes it even cooler is the Spanish Republic continued to exist in exile. That when they fell to Franco in 1939, there was an actual government in exile that went to Paris and then London and then Mexico City uh, that would uh, sit in a clubhouse somewhere in Mexico City and have a little flag and convene and take the minutes. And these were the official acts of the legitimate Spanish government. And then Picasso dies. Oh, and by the way, all the way through the 60s and 70s, there was this fear that Franco was going to come into New York and demand that Guernica be taken back to fascist Spain. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art had lawyers that arranged a huge set of arguments about how Franco doesn't own this painting, which he didn't. Because his government, the monarchy of Spain, was the, was the sworn enemy of the republic that actually did own it, right? So Picasso dies in 73 saying, I don't want this painting going back to Spain until, until it's a republic again. And in 75, Franco dies and Spain becomes more liberal, although it's still a monarchy. And then there's a meeting in New York between the representatives of the Spanish monarchy and Paloma Picasso and all the heirs, where they shake hands and they say, all right, Guernica goes back to Spain now that Franco is dead, but the government of Spain says that the, Paloma, that the Picasso heirs get to have the intellectual property and exploit it and, and, and so that they can charge you for the posters you buy for your, for your dorm room. And everybody let that alone because in 1975, everybody was happy that Spain wasn't exactly Franco's Spain anymore. And, you know, the Spanish Republic had gone out of existence, and let's just clear all this messy property stuff up and let it be. Let it be. However, strictly in terms of the progression of property rights, nobody at that New York meeting has any rights to give each other. Franco's government, the monarchy of Spain, even though Franco is dead, and even though it's becoming more liberal, is still the monarchy of Spain and not the Republic. So it has no rights to give back to, the, to Picasso's heirs. And Picasso's heirs had no rights to give to the monarchy of Spain because their father, Pablo, made a big point that he was not the owner of the painting. What happened to the government in exile? It, it dissolved in 1975 because they all went back to run for parliament now that Franco was dead in Spain. But they, they, but they never transferred. They didn't. they didn't transfer their property to, to, to the government. They just, they just died intestate, right? right? So, so this is what I really, really want to do, OK? I want to create an unincorporated pirate party front called Guernica Unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> and we write the Picasso Estate. And make, make sure that we're writing to the address that's given on the Picasso Estate website as like the copyright control website. Excuse you don't want to reach. Hey, is it live streaming? Do you want the people to know this? Yeah, it's, know, it's fine. That's fine. If they find this, they're more on the ball. They'll be so on the ball that, that <laughs> this won't work anyway. I, I don't care. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> we write the Picasso, and, and because, because there are plenty of like, art historians that are connected to the Picasso estate 
who would not be offended by the political non-commercial dissemination of the image. We don't want to contact them. The people we want to contact for purposes of this booby trap are the most fascist lawyers in Paris who are charged with squashing anybody that, that, that disseminates the images of Picasso like a bug. Now, it's important that we don't tip our hand. We don't declare what we know about the actual lineage of the property right in this painting. We just say, hi there, Picasso Estate. We're an organization and we plan to disseminate Guernica and details from of it, you know, for free, everywhere, on t-shirts and picket signs and all over the internet. And it's all going to be part of labor boycotts and struggles for social justice. And we think that you will want to help us because we're going to ask you to carry links to our Picasso Guernica website on your own web page. Don't you think? Don't you think? And we invite you to discuss the terms under which we may jointly honor Picasso's vision. Okay? And it's very important if you're going to do this to have letterhead. <laughs> Oops. Um, um, Sorry. Um, yeah, to, to have to have letterhead, which and you have to put yourself into the mindset of your opponent here. You have to imagine what some fascist copyright lawyer in Paris is going to do when they get letterhead using details from Guernica, from an organization that has already formed itself to call itself Guernica Unlimited, that gives not one but two addresses in the United States with you know, a URL for a, for a website. They are going to freak out, okay? <laughs> and if this works, and you get a strongly worded cease and desist letter from the Picasso estate saying, no, we will not carry your links on our website. And in fact, we will squash you like a bug because this is the intellectual property of the Succession Picasso. Then, we file immediately a declaratory lawsuit, a lawsuit seeking a declaratory judgment, not in France, but in United States District Court, where we say that, well, we're, we're an organization of, of people that are located in uh, Washington and Boston. We are suing both uh, the Picasso succession and the Kingdom of Spain, because the Picasso, the Picasso succession claims rights that devolve from them making the Kingdom of Spain an indispensable party. So that if it wants, the Spanish government can send lawyers into court in Washington, D.C. to explain why the monarchy of Spain thinks it has any rights in a painting that protested the monarchy of Spain's genocidal destruction of a vast village, right? Okay? And, and, this, and the Picasso succession can explain why they think they have any right to threaten us with litigation when, in fact, Pablo made a big fat point that he never owned this painting anymore. Okay? And we throw this up there, and I, I've already communicated with people in the Spanish Pirate Party <laughs> who are really excited about this idea because they're saying, wow, this is happening at just the right moment now that a right wing government has taken over in Spain, and there's this huge problem about whether this government even has any legitimacy. Because even though it's not Franco's government anymore. It's still the monarchy that he reinstalled during the Spanish Civil War. And if you got the Spanish Pirate Party coming in with us, either as formal plaintiffs or just to demonstrate outside the Museo Reina Sofia, free Guernica, you know, and with, with you know demands all over Europe that the Picasso estate and the Spanish government back off. <laughs> And declare that and agree that no one owns Guernica. That the Spanish Republic died intestate. Picasso's heirs don't own it. The Spanish government doesn't own it. It belongs to the people. This is something they will want to say in Spain. And this is something that if we have going on in declarations and affidavits and links to YouTubes, that we show a US district judge in Washington, DC where we are, after all, American citizens, and our opponents are these ridiculous Euro trash who are claiming rights that they do not own, we don't even have to get to the First Amendment. 
Okay, I'll tell you a real world, I mean, something that I actually already did once. <laughs> uh, this goes back when I was first, I, I, I was out in San Francisco, and I was representing the Hotel Workers Union in Las Vegas. And the MGM Grand had just opened up in Vegas. And if you know anything about it, it's, it's a big emerald green complex. This is back in the days when Vegas wanted to sell itself as a family place. Um, that it's all based on the Wizard of Oz thing. And we were in the middle of like a hot fight to demand recognition at the, at, the, at the casino, so we sent a huge number of hotel workers out to picket the hotel dressed as Dorothy and the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and the Cowardly Lion, okay? And, and almost immediately we get a threat letter from Turner Broadcasting, who was clearly sicked onto us by the hotel and had clearly licensed all this Wizard of Oz themed, Oz -themed to the hotel, uh, it's come to our attention that Turner Entertainment is the sole copyright owner of the Wizard of Oz, and we're going to squash you like a bug if you ever so much as dare, as represent our proprietary characters on a Las Vegas sidewalk again. And this lands on my desk. And my first reaction, 1899 book, is outside the copyright period. It is therefore public domain. And an important rule you should all remember about public domain is that if a work within the copyright period adopts elements that exist outside, that, that pre-existed it, outside the copyright period, you only have copyright protection for the new editions. That you can't somehow extend the copyright protection by creating a new work based on it. So in other words, you know, you could, you could have a musical version of Romeo and Juliet where like the songs that you write for the characters might be copyrighted, but that doesn't mean that you can reach back and demand copyright you know, for, for, for the public domain work. So I get to write this guy back and throw out all the First Amendment arguments and just say, you know what? <laughs> you know, your works are all, were, were all written out as early as 1899. And what these people look like, you know, what the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and Dorothy look like, all existed more than 75 years ago. So you might be able to stop us from singing somewhere over, somewhere over the rainbow, but there ain't no law in America says a citizen can't stick a funnel on his head before he goes out to pick at a hotel. <laughs> the room is sleepers with me. Right, right, and, 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 I put, and, and, and I put a little PS there, and that goes for your little lawn, too. <laughs> uh, an interesting feature of the Barbie litigation, Mattel is just insane about attacking anybody that puts up, you know, Dungeon Barbie or, you know, bar, you know Zombie Barbie or anything like that. They, they really thought that they could squash them. Something that really helped the people defending the paradists of Barbie was to do a little work in examining the, 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 the pedigree of Barbie's intellectual property. And it turns out that in the early 60s, there was a huge amount of litigation by a German toy company that was able to successfully prove that Mattel had stolen the designs uh -huh. for Barbie. That Barbie was actually originally Lily, named after Lily Marlene, which was a children's doll that was produced right after World War II for German girls. And they could prove that a representative of Mattel had gone to a German trade show and taken home a model of that, and then, you know, two, two months later, Mattel was generating exactly the same kind of, you know, overly tall, big busted, unrealistic statues of, of, of blonde women. And, um, and, and this is something that Mattel tried to cover up because they reached a sort of an inconclusive end of the litigation with the Germans, but it was a skeleton in Mattel's closet. Now, strictly speaking, that shouldn't make any difference to the First Amendment argument that zombie Barbie is, is still a you know, fair use, it is a critical comment, it is a parody, and all that. But it really helps color the way that judges think about it. And in fact, when the Ninth Circuit finally delivered the coup de grace against Mattel in their attacks on the paradists, Judge Kaczynski writes this sort of long statement of facts where he's talking about well, you know, Barbie was originally a German streetwalker stolen from Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, which leads me to the next, the next sort of general tactic. Yes. Uh, Michael, as a as a side note, I read that 
the Industrial Revolution in America, which started here in Massachusetts, was the result of industrial espionage. That it yeah. was either Francis Cabot Lowell or someone else, I forget the name, who went over to England, memorized how to make balloon machines, came back here and made a balloon machine, and they started wall right. and ended up moving to Lowell. And and when, when, when there's that famous line from Proudhon about yeah. how property is theft, yeah. which is always <laughs> quoted as some sort of general, high-minded, left-wing <laughs> comment that property is like theft. No, 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 no. <laughs> property is theft. <laughs> yes. yeah. Which Trudeau? No, Proudhon. Oh, oh Proudhon. 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 It was, it was in Providence that the slave and northern Providence right. was the first. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, and, and, and what, what, again, what this lets you do is it lets you jam the radar of right-wing judges who say that they believe in property rights. Because it means that the judge can't generate the kind of indignation against you because you've already impeached the legitimacy of the property claim that's being brought against you even before you get to the First Amendment. And that's why I'm saying the First Amendment is the peace treaty that you get once you kick their ass on all these other issues. <laughs> Okay, collateral weakness. Quick question. What yes. happened to the uh, Wizard of Oz after you sent the letter back? Oh, um, I, should, I, should, I should have mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, we got a contract with the hotel within two weeks. <laughs> because the one thing they did not want to do was to have like a, a, high, you know, a highly motivated large organization, namely the union, spreading the word that the intellectual property on which this hotel was based had become public domain. Oh. Like, we basically achieved <laughs> union rights for a thousand workers in Las Vegas just to shut me up about L. Frank Baum. That's, that's basically how it happened. Okay, so collateral weakness. The First Amendment always occurs within a particular context of its struggles against oppression, where you are doing your enemy an undeserved favor if you make your argument a pure First Amendment argument, always make it sticky, always make it attach to whatever other collateral problems your, your, your target has. And I'll give you an example. The best Supreme Court case on copyright in, in my generation uh, is uh, Acuff Rose versus Two Live Crew. Uh, and it's Acuff Rose. I mean, it's Acuff Rose versus uh, versus Campbell, who was the lead singer of Two Live Crew. Uh, for those of you that weren't around in the early '90s, Two Live Crew was this really awful, mm -hmm. gross, sexist rap group that every single album they ever did just featured the butts of women and thongs, mm -hmm. and they just sang songs about me so horny, and you know, and they did this one song on this one nasty as they want to be album that used. You know, the, the tune and the elements of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman, where they, instead of singing, Oh, Pretty Woman, walking down the street, it was like, Oh, hairy woman, skanky woman, whatever. I mean, it, it was just horrible. And when the Supreme Court took certiorari in the case, I was terrified because I thought this is the worst possible case for us to fight out some kind of fair use parody, you know, kind of claim because it was so unattractive and so gross, and everybody loves Roy Orbison. Oh my God, the godfather of rockabilly, and everybody, and his song, and Joya Roberts was in a movie based on that song, and here are these terrible, gross guys that are just doing this disgusting porno knockoff, and what did I think the Supreme Court was going to do with that? Except the two live crew lawyers were really smart. They played the race card oh. against Roy Orbison, where their entire defense was to bring in expert witnesses, like you know professors of cultural history from the University of Tennessee, who talked about how all of Roy Orbison's career was based on stealing black music and putting a happy, acceptable white face on it. And they also talked about the long tradition that goes back to before the Civil War with enslaved and oppressed sharecropper communities in the <laughs> South of black people singing songs that parody or mimic those of their masters. And no. they put <laughs> this right up in the Supreme Court's Ooh. face where it was all about, are you going to say that black people don't have the right to, to, to like make critical comments using the memes and the 
tropes and the morphemes of, of their white masters, and suddenly Roy Orbison looked like a disgusting criminal. <laughs> and, and, and suddenly, like the guys at Two Life Crew are like covering themselves in the First Amendment, even though they're really kind of like, you know, not, not particularly political people at all. But it worked. It worked because they exploited the collateral weakness. You know, they, 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 they figured out how they could get in at the conscience of the Supreme Court, so that the Supreme Court would not want to seem like they were backing up some kind of segregationist attack on, on, on free speech. <laughs> What's the name of the case? Uh, Acuff Rose versus Camel, 1994. It is the case where the Supreme Court first recognizes, for once and for all, that parody is not an infringement, that, that you know, parody is fair use. Yes. I mean, this had been out there in the courts beforehand, but it's always counterbalanced by courts that want to say, well, that's not parody, that's theft, that's, you know, that's, 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 that's hurting the nature of the copyrighted work. Okay, I, I also think that the next time that the right wants to gin up the flag desecration amendment, that the pirate party should get interested in that. Because the flag desecration amendment is fundamentally a form of extending copyright and trademark. It is an int yes. And not to mention that's the correct way to dispose of a flag is to burn it. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, but, but I mean clearly that, that, that right now right, right now it's already against the law for someone to climb up to the top of the Capitol building and tear down that flag and burn it because that's government property. The point of a, of, of, of a desecration amendment is that you can't even get your own red, white, and blue cloth and make your own thing within that conceptual design and do something to it that offends the source identifying trademark or the intellectual property in copyright that's owned by the government, right? That is what the flag desecration amendment really is. Wait, that exists? No, no, but that's what a flight desecration amendment would be. Oh, it, it would effectively be an extension of copyright. It was on the verge of passing, and I was very surprised right. yeah. that Lieberman yeah. voted against it. I was so surprised. Right, okay. So but, but, it was like but, the only one that... Here's what I'm saying about... Here's what I'm saying about... Here's what I'm saying about fighting ridiculous with ridiculous. Fighting ridiculous against it. Okay, we don't control whether that ever passes, and we... not much. Okay. But... Simply whining about how we believe in freedom of thought and we don't like the fact that Republicans are taking it away from us is like boxing only using your right arm. Okay? What we gotta do is say, okay, if you're gonna block the right hook, here comes the left jab. And what I always want to say whenever they gin up the flag desecration amendment is that I'm against that because I believe in freedom of thought and the, the you know freedom of symbolism, but if the flag desecration amendment passes, the first thing I'm going to do is try to get the Detroit City Council to pass a law criminalizing display of the Confederate flag. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, digging into history is always a very productive exercise. <laughs> okay? That, that quite literally, in 1861, when, when the South suddenly goes to war against the United States, the creation of the rebel battle flag was intended and understood by both sides as a deliberate desecration of the flag of Mr. Lincoln. And in fact, they didn't have time to manufacture their own flags you know, right during Fort Sumter. The only way they could come up with something was to get red cloth and rip out shreds <laughs> from Union flags that they were no longer going to make. And it was understood by everybody to be the mutilated banner of succession. That this was quite literally a representation of the federal flag on fire. And I don't think that <laughs> I don't think that John Boehner or you know or or, or or the Tea Party quite understands what they're doing when they talk about flag desecration. Because it would mean that every bumper sticker in Alabama is going to be around for criminal prosecution. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. This was the official flag of the Confederate government, which was so close to the federal flag in battle that they had to go back to the you know, Confederate battle flag just so they could have something to dis distinguish it. And ironically, 
The first proposals for a, for a flag desecration amendment came from Union veterans in something called the Grand Army of the Republic that was really powerful in around the 1890s. Because they, you know, they were the ones that first came up with like the Boy Scout procedures for folding flags and disposing of them, and you know, and, and we all venerate the flag, and the flag is really something special. Those demands from the Grand Army of the Republic for an amendment criminalizing the, the desecration of the U.S. flag always had a second, a second provision in them saying, and therefore the display of the Confederate flag of secession shall be prohibited. So when we get into this, basically this intellectual property fight, if people are pushing the flag desecration amendment, we can't just say, no, no, we the Pirate Party oppose that. We have to say, and if it passes, we the Pirate Party are going to be out there in every jurisdiction that will listen to us demanding that this means the, the, you know, the, the criminalization of the display of the Confederate flag. Like I say, fight ridiculous with ridiculous. Okay. Um, this has come up in a bunch of other people have, have mentioned this about overt hostility is actually much safer than the kind of stuff that says, oh, we don't really oppose you, we just want to create a sort of fan fiction friendly tribute to you, okay? No, no, overt hostility is way safer because it eliminates what trademark law calls the likelihood of confusion. And I want to tell you about my favorite lawsuit ever, okay? <laughs> It's called Lions Partnership versus Giannoulis, decided by the Fifth Circuit in 1997. Giannoulis, Ted Giannoulis, is otherwise known as the San Diego Chicken. He's this guy that runs around baseball parks dressed as a chicken and provides entertainment for the crowd, you know, jumping up and down on top of the bullpen, you know, bullpen roof and, and stuff like this. And during a Texas Rangers game in 1995, he did something between innings where the, the, the stadium started to play, I love you, you love me, and this big purple dinosaur came walking out into the outfield, at which point the San Diego chicken came over and knocked it over, kicked it, you know, kicked it in the head, whacked it with a big foam rubber mallet, and the crowd went wild. Okay? In short order, the owners of Barney, Lions Partnership, filed a federal lawsuit. <laughs> alleging trademark disparagement. <laughs> and they had a ton of affidavits from, from like fathers of traumatized children who had been in the game who said, and my five-year-old girl turned to me and said, they're hurting Barney. And the theory was all developed about how you know Barney was a valuable trademark, and here's this guy who's making money off of displaying Barney and doing things with it. That that diminished the value of the trademark and you know and you know yada yada. And um, what the San Diego chicken did, again, did just like the two life crew, he did not content himself with First Amendment fair use defense. What he did, he brought in experts in child psychology who basically said that Barney should be beaten up. <laughs> <laughs> Preaches this ideology to children that everything is okay and nothing can ever possibly go wrong, which oh, leaves them incredibly wow. vulnerable when things actually do. Okay, and the 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 the, the sight of the San Diego chicken just kicking the shit out of Marty in front of you know in front of forty thousand people was actually one of the healthiest things that could possibly have happened here. And you know, in front of judges, they kind of enjoy this shit. They really do. <laughs> federal judge, an expert witness like that, they are not going to get a stick up their ass about Barney's intellectual problems. <laughs> they are, they are going to write a really fun, libertarian opinion all about how this is a negative comment on Barney. Nobody is suggesting that Barney and Lions Partnership are sponsoring this display. Any negative effect that comes from this display comes from the transmission of the idea which a trademark does not insulate you from. Huh. And you get judges to say very good things like this only because you don't content yourself with the anemic First Amendment argument. 
because you hit them on the collateral vulnerabilities of the speech that they're trying to defend as, as, as you, know, you know, hemmed in in the enclosure. Which brings me back to Barbie. Um, you know, the same kind of thing goes on with Barbie, where uh, it makes a huge amount of difference that you're not, that, that you don't stay silent about how fucked up Barbie is as a commodity. <laughs> If you preach that long and loud and march in with expert witnesses and talk about all that, courts will slowly have that seep in to their understanding of the nature of the work. And as First Amendment folks, we don't believe that that should make any difference. Like the value and protection of speech shouldn't depend on a federal judge agreeing that Barbie is fucked up. But believe me, it helps. Okay, so I mean, and, 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 and if a corporation has made a threat to you and is having to decide whether they're going to escalate from threat to open warfare, their understanding of you as someone who is armed with that collateral attack will make a very big, you know, will have a very big effect on, 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 on their decision making. Yeah, this is an example of a really poorly <laughs> lawyered defense. This came out just shortly after Two Live Crew. Penguin Books did this, which was a knockoff of Dr. Seuss about the O.J. Simpson trial. And, um, you know, it was all about, and then came Judge Ito, and then he did say. I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, just in the style of Dr. Seuss. And they said to the judge when, when the Dr. Seuss Enterprises sued them, oh, well, it's a parody. Look at Two Live Crew. And the court says, uh, no, you're not making a hostile comment against Dr. Seuss. You're only talking about the O.J. Simpson trial, and you're just ripping off all the commercially valuable things that Dr. Seuss developed. Um, and this is not really a parody of Dr. Seuss. It's just a knockoff using Dr. Seuss, and they enjoined the book, which was really ruinous to Penguin Books because they had already, you know, you know, printed and sold off. I mean, it was a it was a really big fat problem. But that that leads me. I mean, that that, that leads me to a, to an interesting uh, interesting thing. What was yeah. the outcome? What? What was the outcome of that? Dr. Seuss won. They got an injunction against uh, against the publication of that book. Um. And it was badly lawyered. If I had been Penguin's lawyer, I would have tried to torture something together by saying, we hate Dr. Seuss because Dr. Seuss is part of the bourgeois cultural malaise that results in things like the spectacle of the O.J. Simpson trial. And we are linking the horrible Dr. Seuss with the horrible O.J. Simpson spectacle. And this is one big comment on fucked up bourgeois culture. And, uh, you know, <laughs> but they didn't do that. They didn't do that well enough. But it, it raises an interesting question. That contrary to everything that they should be doing under the First Amendment, which is blinding themselves to content and protecting speech categorically, what the judges were doing here was acting like literary critics to say, uh, we've read the entire book, and we think the book really is, should be classified as a satire rather than a parody. Which means that, like, you know, federal trademark and copyright litigation that follows along that line is going to be completely based on, like, the cultural understanding of the federal judges who are, who are reading, and, reading this stuff and looking at these websites. Every day, which is bad, but like all bad things, it opens up opportunity. And the opportunity here is that if someone had litigated this all the way through, and the position of Dr. Seuss had been, this is a satire, not a parody, I would have demanded massive boxcar discovery of every document that Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss, had ever written in order to determine whether he was really ultimately culturally linked to the ideology of the O.J. Simpson spectacle. Okay? I would have called expert witnesses about the nature and intent of Dr. Seuss. I would, have, I would have had people say, Dr. Seuss is dead, and the estate has changed the original intent of the cat in the hat from being something joyful, fun, and subversive into something grim and depressing and owned. And I would have taken the deposition of every fucking member of that family to determine that 
they would admit that Dr. Seuss believed in play and believed in parody and believed in the subversion of the established order. And it would have been very uncomfortable because there's no good answer to that question for them. If they say, yes, he believed in that, then this doesn't look so bad. And if they say, uh, no, he was a grim capitalist prick just like we are, you know, <laughs> then you can do something with that. Uh, all right, finally, I want to talk. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, if this is a commercially successful book, why are we going for injunction as opposed to like royalty payments? Oh, they didn't. This was a preliminary injunction. So, which prevented them from printing the book, right? Yeah, but the book had already been printed. It prevented them from disseminating it anymore. Yes, it and it must have settled shortly afterwards because there's no further published decisions. But there's no question that Penguin Books forked over every dime of profit they made on selling this. Hmm. It's just strange that they're going for injunction. I mean, it's not destroying the legacy of Dr. Seuss. Okay, it's unauthorized use you want. Okay. Get money from it. Google it. Dr. Seuss right. Enterprises versus Penguin Books. I mean, okay. I believe you. I just don't understand the logic. That's, that's all. Yeah. There's nothing well, about any of this. Again, you're right that it's irrational, but that's actually a good thing for us. Okay. Because it means that we can sucker our opponents into, into going after us on Google. Like, there's no reason that Picasso Estate should really care about what Guernica Unlimited is doing. It's not really reducing the flow of their of revenues into Paloma Picasso. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, the, 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 the bureaucrats who sit around in Paris charged with squashing anything like this are, don't have the mental flexibility right, right. to make that kind of judgment, mm -hmm. okay? Now, this is my favorite of all. That instead of, com instead of complaining that intellectual property converts thought into commodity. Instead of saying that it's wrong that thought should be free and you're turning it into an article of commerce, when they say, we own this, you can't use it, we're going to stop its dissemination, they start running up against some very interesting commercial law doctrines. Like, and if someone says, you can't use that speech, it's not speech, it's our own commodity. One response is, oh, well, if it's a commodity, how come you're engaging in price fixing? How come you're engaging in a horizontal combination that leads to an oligopoly? How come you just violated Section 20 of the Clayton Act and Section 2 of the Sherman Act, which would give us a right to treble damages against you for seeking to restrain the free flow of commodities? And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's the type of thing that they teach you all, all on here. This isn't exactly the, the, the type of version, but it's like if, if, if you know, um, Coke and Pepsi agree with each other that they're not going to deal with somebody who sells cane sugar, then this person has a right of action under the antitrust laws against both because this is a combination in restraint of trade. So, look. You don't have to come up with a completely valid theory that would make it all the way through the Supreme Court here. The very fact that you're even using phrases like price fixing, horizontal combination, you know, uh, you know, uh, violation of uh, violation of the Sherman Act, whatever, mm -hmm. is going to completely freak out the copyright stooge who's sit sitting at his desk trying to threaten you out of something. Okay, because that's outside of his expertise, mm -hmm. and that's an example of like one of these booby traps where by smashing you, they actually create a much, much bigger problem for the corporation. Sorry, I'm, I'm, a, I'm sort of wearing three hats here. I have two journal certificates, I'm a political activist, liberal, or that radical kind of liberal, and I'm in the independent video industry. Um, and I have to say, you, you need to do exactly as Michael stated. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, no, a lot of these groups at the Powers Party, I'm not a member of any political party, not even a Democratic party. But a lot of these people, organizations and, and parties, want to fight outside the system. You know, the socialists want to take over, you know, and I'm like, no, you don't. You fight within the system. You use their own ammunition, you use their own laws, as, as you stated. You know, the Sherman Act. You don't have to go look up the Sherman Act. You know, you fight within the system. You use everything that you have to right. so what, 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 internally to fight them. That's, I mean, these guys, yeah. intellectual property is incoherent, is a massive contradiction. So that anybody 
I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. <clears throat> Another aspect, though, yeah. that I really like, that what you're talking about, yes, you're fighting within the system, but it's not a fight to get elected. You are booby-trapping, as you're saying, and you're not trying, you don't have to run for office in order to do that. Correct. So there's a sort of extra political aspect here that is very appealing to a party like the Pirate Party that's a very small party, right? And it doesn't have people in office. And I don't, I don't see it as working within the system. I see it as letting Wile E. Coyote just destroy himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there, there's certain paths that, uh, of, of a friend of mine who went through law school and she works as a legal assistant. She was told by her law professors that her theories, though they're correct in law, don't follow the usual usages of the law. And that's what you're talking about, is coming at using the law from a, an angle that's not usually used for. Right, and if, yeah. you, if you are unable to surprise them in, in your response to their threats, they will, they will not be deterred from anything. They know all about fair use in the First Amendment. They are ready for that. And they know that a majority of federal judges out there are not going to stop from issuing an injunction against you uh, just because you're out there you know, quoting the language of, of, of the First Amendment. Um, and and it's also, I also want to say about the First Amendment that I think it's a mistake for liberals to say that the First Amendment gives a right of free speech. It doesn't it give the right. It recognizes the pre-existing right, the inalienable right, the God-given right. And it's really, it's, it's really a restraint on Congress to keep Congress from making itself ridiculous by even trying to prevent the freedom of speech. And, but right. even within the freedom of speech, I, I took journalism courses, I got a major in public relations in the 80s, long before the internet and all this. Even if you have the constitutional right to free speech, you don't have 100% free speech. It's libel laws, slander laws, you know, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. You, you know, mm -hmm. there are some restrictions to free speech. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I think that as soon as you start saying, oh, the right's not absolute, you're just saying that there's no right at all. Yeah. I mean, because as soon as you say the right's not absolute, then the door is open for, for, the, for the corporation to march in and say, and in this case, the market and our economic rights and all the powers of the copyright establishment dictate that it outweighs your right. Yeah. Uh, last quick thing. Uh, you, you can uh, scream fire in a crowded theater if you just live one. <laughs> We're not going to try that. Any examples of the antitrust law? Because it's true. Or threats being used? Um, I mean, not, not all the way through, public, through published opinion, but I, I do that all the time when corporations threaten unions on various grounds. Yeah. And I come back and say, oh, really? Well, uh, we'd like to engage in like massive discovery with depositions to determine just how much malpractice this hospital is engaged in. You know, like how much are you guys actually in a vertical combination with, you know, with, with banks and, and, and suppliers and other hospital corporations? Because we think that any damages you claim come from your own illegal conduct. So is this uh, at the stage when they just sent you the cease and desist, or is it when they already filed in court? Both. But Both. I've, had, I've had lawsuits pulled right. after they get my request for all documents relating to their price fixing. Okay. Yeah. A uh, quick thing on naked licensing, little known fact, um, copyright loves to protect itself by bleeding over into trademark. We've talked about trademark a lot today. Um, but something that really hurts them is there's a doctrine of trademark that a trademark is abandoned, it is destroyed. If you allow somebody else to use your trademark without retaining quality control over, um, you know, quality control over the use of that mark, so for example, if McDonald's just let some greasy spoon mom and pop use the name McDonald's in the Golden Arches, but doesn't make sure that the patties are just the same kind of processed crap that you get in a in a mainstream McDonald's, then the idea is that the public isn't given a stable single association between the name and the quality control. Okay? And it happens all the time that corporations just let other people make money by letting other people use their name without exerting that control. And if you catch them at it, 
Not only is there something wrong with that particular thing, but you say, okay, you, you've lost your right to claim any kind of monopoly in that trademark. And that's something that you can use, like for instance, on Dr. Seuss. Like what I would say on Dr. Seuss is, um, gee, I don't think Dr. Seuss actually has a trademark to assert against us, because I saw that ridiculous movie that came out with Jim Carrey, or you know, the war, I mean, you know, any of the stupid movies they made about Dr. Seuss, and it looks nothing like the book, and I don't think that anybody at the Dr. Seuss estate is exercising any quality control to make sure that you know, the, the derivative secondary approved uses of the thought really have any comedic contact with the original intent. And if you can show that, then you're getting somewhere on naked licensing, and you're making them worry that, that you've, got a commercial, you've got a commercial doctrine that's going to screw up their copyright attack against you. Do you remember the um, Ludens Kopf drops, the two gentlemen? Remember their names? Yeah. I don't know. One was trade and one was Mark. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the old Ludens Kopf drops. Uh, um, so, anyway, um, just, to, just to conclude, uh, I. Michael, yes. Oh, that invalidates a trademark, but how does it work against copyright? It doesn't, it's just that they like to. They, they like to sort of use trademark because there's no expiration of the copyright period. The, a trademark that's been around for more than 99 years is still valid. Right. So that they protect, I mean, that's what Disney is fixing to do with Mickey Mouse. Oh, that's what they're trying to do. I mean, they push the copyright right back to protect extensions. Mickey Mouse like one more time, but even that deadline's coming up. I see. And so they're going to try to protect it on, um, right. So, so look, I, I mean, well, I, again, what I'm saying is that it is a very happy hunting ground, provided that we don't confine ourselves to just making self-satisfied academic arguments about the First Amendment. The First Amendment helps those who help themselves. And you will get the First Amendment as the bottom line outcome, as the peace treaty, only after you have kicked their ass six ways from Sunday in all of these collateral ways. And the good news is that that's possible because intellectual property is completely contradictory. It is completely full of holes. And if only you start finding out the hidden pulleys in the system that push in the opposite direction to where they want to go, you're going to end up making them look foolish. They don't own the thing to begin with. They've got collateral vulnerabilities. You are attacking them head on and saying things about their product that are true that they don't want publicized even if they could beat you on a copyright claim. Plus, they've got commercial antitrust problems of their own, and there's much more. But if anyone's interested in the Guernica booby trap, um, uh, Jamie knows how to reach me, um, and and I would love to get that going. Could you do tactic number two? I just didn't write it down. Uh, tactic number two. What was that? That was uh, exploit collateral weaknesses. Thanks. Nice.